welcome to Second Servings. It is your weekly something extra. And my concept actually for Second Servings is changing a little bit. I thought I was always going to do something based on the episode prior, but I think I'm going to mix it up, especially because like last week I talked about my story with my previous mentor. This week we're talking about something I saw on Instagram that I wanted to get into and be part of the conversation. So I saw a post by Polish Folk Witch, who I follow, who also tagged two other creators that she was collaborating with, Ella Harrison, who is a German Folk Witch, and the Red-Headed Witch. So I follow. They put up a very interesting post. They wanted to start these conversations about centered around like social media and the spiritual slash witchcraft community. And I thought it was really interesting and I was like, ooh, I wanna participate. So there's a lot of really good questions and prompts that she has in here. I'll give you my opinion on everything and I want you, whoever's listening, to also think about what your opinions of these different topics are because I think they're really interesting. So I gave you guys a lot of my background last week, but I'll just do a quick overview. So got really into the tarot community in my early 20s when I started reading tarot. Then I started my shamanic apprenticeship in my mid-20s. I met people through that. And then I started getting really into the more spiritual community. I'll call it alternative spirituality or whatnot. I got really into that maybe three, four years ago. I was doing a lot of fairs and I met a ton of people Actually, I've been doing fairs since I was like 23, 24. A lot of people I know in the spiritual community are through the fairs I've done. But I started doing a fair that's really popular here in New Jersey called Lunar Fair. I met a ton of people through that. I did a like marketing cohort last year. I met a lot of really cool people through that. And then just on Instagram. And then, of course, lastly, through this podcast, I've met so many cool people and connected with so many awesome people in the online spiritual slash witchcraft community. So it's been really fun to get to know people and see what people practice and have them share their stuff online. On my personal page, I do share some stuff. I don't share a ton about my practice. I work a lot with ancestors and things like that. Part of the reason I like to share stuff, and I even started sharing anything was because when I started sharing stuff years ago, like with Tarot, I didn't see a lot. There was, I know a few of them. There's the first person I can think of is V, who I love so much. But there wasn't a ton of black tarot card readers that I would see. I know I'm leaving like big ones out and it's just gone out of my head. I'm sorry. But there wasn't a ton of black tarot card readers. I knew a few of them. But I thought, let me put my face out there. Like, I'm part of this community, too, which was really good. And I've shared some other things about my practice, just about how I do healing work and just trying to explain it. And I really love connecting with people online because I love seeing how other people practice their spirituality. I love seeing and like, I'm not gonna lie. I really do love the aesthetic. Like, I'm a cottagecore girly. If it were up to me, I'd wear frilly dresses every single day with bows in my hair because that's honestly, that's my core. Like, that's who I am. And I love kind of the witchy aesthetic. I'll get more into how I feel about witchy aesthetic later. But I enjoy a lot of these content creators who I know spend probably so much time doing their content to make it look absolutely beautiful. I enjoy it. I enjoy looking at it. Not going to lie. I think it's awesome. As for how I think social media has affected the community, there's a lot of pros and a lot of cons to this. I feel that on the good side, it's connected people. You find a lot of people practicing different forms of spirituality in places where they don't know anybody else. I've met people who live in the middle of the Bible Belt and they're like, I don't have anybody for miles practicing what I practice. So it's really fun to meet people online. People And you don't have to be in the Bible, but you can be anywhere. You could be in the middle of New York City and not know somebody. But it's like there's, it brings people out of isolation. People get to talk about their practice and what they do with others. 
get to compare practices if, if that's what they want to do. And I think it's a really positive thing in that way. Now, I think the negative ways that social media comes in to it is that there's a lot of people who think they know what they're doing just because they saw it on social media or because they did it one time. So they're like on social media talking about how they're experts. They're on social media charging $400 for a tarot session and they've only been reading tarot for three months and they're still reading out of the book. In that case, I don't think it's so good because I feel like they're exploiting people and we'll get more into this in a second. <laughs> Polish folk witch, Ella Harrison and the redheaded witch broke these things up into like how many different basically like five different topics so the first topic is the impact on the community so we're talking I'm just talking about social media community the next question is talking about how do I feel that social platforms such as TikTok Instagram and YouTube have impacted education and sharing information I think that those uh, the all of these channels are great in their own ways I think that it's awesome to be able to go on YouTube to learn what other people are doing in their practice. But I also, like I was saying before, there's people who really don't have a lot of experience in what they're doing and then they go and teach it to other people. Not just share it because there's some people who are just sharing their practice and that's great. Do what you want to do. But there's people who are actually teaching and telling people how to do things when they've only been doing it for a month. Or they've only done it once. And I'm like, that's a little iffy. Especially if they don't know exactly what they're doing. But they're giving everybody else advice on what to do. I don't love that. The other thing I have a little bit of an issue with sometimes with social media and the spiritual community is like making people feel like they need all this stuff. Like I said, I love the witchy aesthetic. It's cute, but in the end of the day, we all know that you don't need a thousand crystals if you can't afford that or you don't want that. You don't need all the fanciest stuff. You don't need to go to this organic garden that's so far from your house that you have to drive to to get these expensive herbs. You could use more common. There's a lot of things you don't need. So when people see these aesthetics, sometimes they think, oh, I got to buy this. I got to do that. I got to do this. You don't need to buy the expensive oil from this maker if you can't afford it or don't want to. There's alternatives. So I think sometimes people think they need all those things to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And it's just not necessary. And I do think that a lot of that comes from social media. Now, this question I thought was so interesting. This is the last uh, question on this impact on the community. Is consuming witchcraft content becoming a substitute for practice? And I, yes, I 100% believe so. I see so many people just being, I heard blah, 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 blah. And if you do blah, 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 this will happen. Okay, here's the thing. Everything is done with intention. We all know that. I don't have to explain that to you. But the issue is, if just because you saw it and you do it, does it mean that it will work? I've seen people who have huge, massive social media followings performing their work on social media. And it's great. And it's and there's nothing wrong with that. It's great. I like to watch it. It's cool. But other people watch it and they don't think, oh, this person did any work before that. They don't even realize that these people have relationships with if they work with certain deities, they have relationships that they've built up over years. They have practiced. They have spoken. They have prayed. They have done everything to develop these relationships with their spiritual teams, whether it's their ancestors or guides, deities, whatever. And that's why these things are working. It's not working because they're just beyond anybody and they're just so special. It's working because they, they work to have these special relationships with their people. I have seen and have heard of people going online, seeing these things, and then all of a sudden they're like, it didn't work when I did it. First of all, just consuming the, con just watching it and then you doing exactly the same thing as that person doesn't mean it's going to work. 
Doesn't mean it's going to work, especially if you don't have that relationship. If you haven't built your practice up. If you're just like, I'm just going to do it. Okay, you can, but you... But nine times out of 10, you're wasting your time. You haven't built that relationship. So how's it going to work? Just because you saw the social media and because, I don't know, some popular witchy, she, they, gay, it doesn't matter. Did it? It doesn't mean it's going to work because you do it, girl. It's just not. You got to watch out for that. Got to watch out. Okay. Next. Topic number two. We're going to go to influencer authenticity. They're asking like for influencers, how much is stage and how much is reality? I always think that because I will watch videos and reels and TikTok videos of people doing things. And again, the aesthetic, it's picture perfect. But I'm like, how long did it take them to do this? To get everything just right, to videotape it, to edit it. And again, it's not bad. That's fine. It's it's not a problem. We consume it because we enjoy it. But I always wonder like how much of that is real practice and how much of that is just, I'm just going to make this look really good for the camera. It reminds me of people always post these like spiritual baths. If you ever see them and it's like a bathtub full of flowers and floating candles and the water is blue. And I'm like, nobody's taking a spiritual bath like that maybe they are and just nobody told me but i've never seen anybody take a spiritual bath it's full of first of all you got to clean up all those flowers afterwards and you don't want to throw them in the garbage if it's spiritual you probably got to put them outside and if you're in the city then where are you putting them if you're in the suburbs maybe you can put them in your yard or somewhere outside but like oh the work right Nobody's doing it. If I've taken a spiritual bath, there's a little oil, there's a little blessing, maybe a little bit of holy water sprinkled in because I love it. And that's it. I'm not doing this whole thing. But again, if you do, that's fine. I'm just saying that's not what most people are doing when they're taking a spiritual bath. So there's that. So I always wonder what's the reality between that and what is. Another question in these influencer authenticity. Oh, this one's a crazy one. Have I ever, it talks about encountering grifters in the community and how do we recognize them and what are the significant signs of grifters if you have a good again i'm talking about the aesthetic again if you have a good aesthetic you can become popular quick right if you have all the beautiful wall hangings or plants and you have that dark academia look maybe in your home it doesn't have to be dark academia but i think the girls love dark academia right If you have all that, you can become popular very quickly online because people will just like to consume your content because it's cute, which is fine. But that's how the grifters get in is that they're just really good at that. So once people have the witchy aesthetic, another thing about online is you don't know how people really live. You see these people and they're always running through fields with flowers all over their hair or like, They're always like in the woods or the cape and they're doing magical spells over a fire in the woods. Is that their everyday? People present in a certain way that makes you think they are extra special or that they are extra spiritual because all all you ever see is them doing that kind of stuff. I don't mind that because it's none of my business what people want to post, but it's also like be, be really for real right now. You don't live like that. But I think that when people post like that all the time and they just come out of nowhere, that's another thing. That's the other key. There's lots of people I know who post like that and I love it. But when they come out of nowhere and they're like, I'm super spiritual and I'm a list some title that you've never heard of, that's indication there might be a grifter. Also, when you've never heard of this person, never heard of them from Adam and they're charging outrageous prices. I'm talking about like a 30 minute consultation will cost you 250. And all you're getting, and when you get there, you're getting somebody who's reading tarot to you from a book. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying nobody's worth that much, but what I am saying is if I do a Zoom tarot card reading and your ass has the book next to you, And I paid you $250, my friend. We're going to fight today. We're going to fight today. How do we recognize the grifters? I'm telling you, pricing can be a thing. I know pricing is a big point of contention with people. But when I've never met you from Adam, nobody, that's another thing. 
not like everybody I know in this spiritual community is like the important ones or anything, but I never heard of you. And I don't know anybody who knows you. Like I've never heard anybody be like, oh yeah, I have readers. Like I know people who are readers who charge a bit much, but I know why, because they're good. Because I know them and I've heard of them and people are like, oh yeah, she's so good. She's this, she's that. Yeah, I'll pay that much because I know this person is so good. I got a reading a couple months ago, a flash sale from Caitlin Grania. They are freaking amazing. So like, I don't mind, I'll, I'm going back to them. They deserve it. You know what I'm trying to say? And like, also I think if they have no lineage, what I mean by lineage is like, where did they learn from? Where did they learn their information from? They don't need to have a definite lineage, but explain to me how you gained the knowledge that you gained, how? And if you tell me some story that don't make no sense, well, uh, you're probably a grifter. A sunbeam came down and da, da, da. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that a sunbeam may, maybe did come down to you and tell you that. How did you, like, how did you explore that? And don't tell me this happened to you last week. I'm sorry, time does matter. Don't tell me that you learned all this stuff last week because I don't believe you. I'm sorry, I just don't. Like, if you're a year in and you're like, yeah, I started reading tarot a year ago and here I am, I'm, I'm giving tarot hard readings. Okay, fine, I get that. You better not be charging 250 for 30 minutes, but I get it. Like, yeah, okay, you've been reading tarot, you learn. Even if you were like, I've been reading tarot for six months. And now I'm starting to charge people. Okay, I get that. That's not so bad all the time. But like, I need to know. And I better not see a book in your hand. Let me tell you something. Okay, sorry, moving on. And I only go on about this book thing because I've seen it. Because it's happened to me. I have paid somebody for a tarot card reading. And they pulled out a book. Me, somebody who reads tarot. Don't you dare pull out a book in front of me. Because you're just telling me you don't know how to read. Like, oh my gosh. Anyway, okay. Let's keep going. I'm hung up on this reading thing, so let me stop. Okay, so next. So some of the things, so the next question is about tools. What's good for, to decipher misinformation and how can we help prevent as a community the widespread information, misinformation? Sources. Sources, please list your sources. Where'd you find that out? Where'd you find that out? If I ask you how you know something, you better be able to tell me. Like, there's a lot of really cool creators on here. And I love, so if you listen to this podcast, obviously, you know that I love some history and I love some, like, different, love it to learn from different cultures. I need to know how you learned it. So my authors out here, that's why I love them because the authors, they're out here giving you facts. They're like, this is where I read this. This is where I, I read this book that was written in 1542 and this is where I got my info from. I love that. We need to source and cite things. You, or at least know where somebody can find it. I'm sorry. I hear so much stuff that people say that's not true at all. It never happened. What are you talking about? Like people just say stuff about, oh, this spirit, that spirit. That's not even true. And it's even like a tradition I probably don't follow. Man, I know that's not true. Because even knowing that culture, that doesn't make sense. We need to be able to cite where we get our information. You don't need to read every single book on it to say that this fact. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if I say, hey, where'd you learn that? Where'd you get that from? Oh, there's a really good website. There's this professor. There's this book. There's this person who told me who I went to this town and I met this person and they told me that. You know what I'm trying to say? Even oral history matters. That's another thing we can talk about. Somebody tweeted that. I didn't come up with that. Somebody, not tweeted, thread. Talked about how oral history is so important. Anyway, cite, citation. We need to cite our sources in the community. We need to say where we get stuff. We need to say how we learned it. Yeah, sources, super important. The next one is what I touched on before is talking about people with large followings and how we automatically assume that people with large followings are experts. Ooh, this is a hard one because I know people with very large followings. And as soon as we hear, oh, this, you see this person has, I don't know, 900,000 followers. We're just assuming that that person knows everything, right? Because why wouldn't they? Why do they have so many followers? 
The reason, again, I'm going to not stop saying this about aesthetic. The reason this person has so many followers is because of their aesthetic. It's because of the aesthetic half the time. It's not like the person, I'm not saying that person doesn't know what they're doing. But I'm also making the point that like a lot of the time it's because this person has a great aesthetic and we all like to look at it. So it doesn't make them more of an expert than anybody else. You don't need to go to college to know stuff. You don't. I don't believe that college education is the end all and be all of understanding something. But we have people in the community who have master's degrees in these types of histories, religious um, education, and they don't have thousands of followers, but they know more than people who have a million followers. I follow professors who will have like 700 followers. Like, like maybe say something so interesting, but it's just not like exciting. It's not exciting to hear this guy explain to me what jihad actually means. Nobody wants to hear this guy, this random Islamic scholar tell me that because he doesn't have a cute aesthetic. He's just talking. What he's saying is super educated and very fascinating, but nobody wants to listen to that. You see what I'm trying to say? So I don't think... A big following necessarily means anything. I think anybody can have a big following. But also, it doesn't mean that just because you have a big following, you're fake. It just means you're really good at marketing. That's what I think. Okay, so we're going to move on to topic number three, which is imposter syndrome and FOMO. So this question actually really pertains to me a lot because they're asking about, okay, I used to have profound jealousy. I'm not going to lie. I'll tell you guys the truth. I used to be very jealous of certain creators because I'm not like a clever Instagram person. I'm not a clever marketing person. I've never been. I don't know what to put on it on Instagram. I used to be really jealous of other creators that they had so many followers and like they were making all these interesting videos. But I think now I realize that's their ministry. That's what they're good at. And everybody's good at something different, right? Everybody can't be an influencer. Everybody cannot be excellent at social media. Everybody does not have the drive to or the time to make these videos. I now just enjoy the videos that I watch and the information that I get from them way more because I'm like, I stop comparing myself to people who they're just really good at it. You know what I mean? There's a couple people I'm thinking of like right now. Oh, like I remember a year ago, I started seeing Mara Starling on my TikTok and I was just like, damn, she's really good at TikTok. I was like, damn, she's very good at this. <laughs> like, like she is like her personality. And I just I've let go of being jealous because some people are just good. And some people like me just I don't know what to do. Sometimes I'll post a meme or two and just whatever. I'm trying also. And another thing now I'm just going to start mentioning names to of people I know. I took a course with Captolia and she, it was all about marketing. She is such a good teacher. And she, we had a whole section about social media and she made me realize this is all, it's my own journey in social media, right? Like it's whatever you want to post and it's supposed to be fun. That's the whole point of it. It's supposed to be a good time. Not supposed to stress you out. Let it be fun. Let let yourself shine through the way you want to, whether it's educational, whether it's for fun. And then I see people like Moss and Mara Starling and I see that's how they use it for fun. Like, you know what I mean? And also to educate because they actually have very informative videos. But like people like that, they're just being themselves, but also like getting their point across. And I'm like, ah, that's social media, right? So if I get better at it, that'd be awesome. (laughs) But who knows? I might never. And it's okay. Because uh, it's just not my ministry. Podcasting is something I love. And podcasting is something I realize that I'm good at that. At least I think I am. This is my ministry. Another really good question that they have here is if I've ever experienced like the FOMO of like the social media spirituality world, has it ever taken advantage of me financially or otherwise? I'm feeling like I need to get something or I need to fit in to buy a certain book or something like that. I think in the past, yeah, I can't think of examples off the top of my head, but I know like I think in the past I wanted to be connected with certain people because they seemed like they were the up and coming person. And I really desperately wanted to be not like popular, 
But like I wanted to be I want to be where the people are. <laughs> like I wanted to be cool. You know what I mean? Now I don't care about that so much. And it's not like I don't care. Because like I said, through this podcast, I've met so many cool people. And I'm very excited to call those people my acquaintances. But now it's more I'm just enjoying people for who they are and letting them be themselves and not having to be like connected with those people. I could just be like, oh, that person's really cool. And like just from afar and let them be them. Why do I have to be like all up in their business? Also, I don't need to fit in anymore. I can be who I am. I am who I am and everybody is who they are and I don't need to fit in anymore and it's okay. I think it all has to do with me though. That's not their problem. It's my problem. I think I was lacking self-confidence. I think I wanted to be part of this community, but I didn't know where I belonged and now I realize maybe I'm in my own category, but it doesn't matter because everybody's in their own category. It all had to do with me and my own self-confidence when I felt like I had to do what everyone else is doing or buy the books everybody else is buying. Now I don't feel like that so much. And then when I practice my craft, do I compare myself to people, what I see online? Not really, because my craft's a little different. I don't completely identify as like a witch. I don't know what I identify as. I just hear doing some stuff and talking to the ancestors. So I don't know, but I don't really try to compare my practice, especially people who, especially because I know a lot of people online who are doing either closed practices or practices from their native homeland or their ancestry that have nothing to do with me. So I'm not going to compare myself to them because it's a completely different experience that they're having than I'm having. So it's not a problem. My practice is not really influenced by other people. I don't do stuff because other people um, tell me to do it. My relationship and my practice is... My practice is completely based on my relationship with my deities and my guides and my gods. It's more based on that. It doesn't really have anything to do with social media. So I don't think it would look much different. I think it's, it, I do want to hear what other people have to say about that though, because I wonder, I really do want to know how much people think like I do stuff based on other people or what I want people to see. I really, I, I can't wait to hear some of the answers people are going to have to some of these questions. Okay, Ooh, we're getting into it. Capitalizing off the community. Do I consider online communities as equally valid to in-person communities? Yes, 100%. Okay. Y'all remember COVID, right? <laughs> so I know COVID's still here. Don't yell at me. I know. But during COVID, online was how we all got our solace. I do think online communities are just as equal as in person because I think sometimes even more, and I'll explain, we are able now because of the internet to link up and hear ideas from people all over the world. You can get stuff from anywhere in the world. You can talk to people from different parts of the world and see how they practice their practice and how they do this. And it's fascinating. I've had people on my podcast who I've interviewed in the UK, who are in Australia, who are in Southeast Asia. I've had people all from all over the world be able to talk to me and relay their ideas, not only all over the world, but all over this country, the United States. I live on the East Coast. I've had people talk to people on the West Coast, from the South, from the Northeast, from the Southeast, like from everywhere. I think it's awesome that we can all connect in this way and learn so much from each other. I think the it's an inv- these communities are invaluable. I've learned so much from people who live thousands and of miles away from me, oceans away from me, and I've loved connecting with every single one of them. It's been such a wonderful experience. That's why I love the internet, honestly. For that reason, and that's why I really do like social media because I've met so many awesome people that I know if it weren't for social media and the communities that I get to participate in, I would not meet these people. So I I love that. What are some of the current dangers? What are some of the dangers of the current phenomenon of capitalizing off the witchcraft community? All right. There's a couple of things going on with this question, I feel like. Number one, there's nothing wrong with making money, Okay. I'm just going to say it. I know people hate to hear it, but there's nothing wrong with making money. We all need money to survive. 
I need money to survive. I don't know about you. Unless you live off the grid and you grow all your own food and you make your own clothes and you generate your own light, you're going to need some money. I think the problem with people making money off witchcraft, there's a couple areas that make no sense. First of all, let's even start with the whole sage thing. Now, we heard about like white sage is they're saying it's not endangered anymore, but it is stop picking it from everywhere, basically. But also smudging is its own ceremony. I know so many people who call it that and that's not what they're doing. They're just smoke cleansing which is also fine, but don't call it smudging if it's not smudging. And we all know that now. But because of because so many people saw people use sage all the time, that's all everybody does now. Everyone's just like, oh, I gotta use sage. You can literally use sage you grow in your garden. I use common sage because it grows. And if I want to use it, I can use it. And I also use rosemary because it's cheaper and it's easier to grow. And it's also easier to find in the, you can get that in the grocery store. But I digress. Um, People look at it as like people don't see the depth in it because of like the internet and because like people like I can just buy sage and clear. You're not putting your intention into that. You're not smoke clearing with intention. Everything you can I can burn whatever herb I want (laughs) and walk around my house. It doesn't do anything if I'm not putting intention into it. If I'm not putting my practice into it, what does it really mean? And I feel like people are now seeing like people also see how much money you can make from showing people stuff. Oh, the other issue I have with capitalizing off like witchcraft is that there are true and real practitioners doing wonderful work in this community. You know them, I know them. And there's tons that I don't know who are doing absolute wonderful work. And then there's people who see that person can make a, who's making like a good amount of money. I could make that kind of money. We work as spiritual practitioners with people who are a lot of the times at their, not at their best. I know I, I do healings for people who are going through shit, people who are going through stuff. And if all I wanted to do is make money, I could do it. I could prey on people. I could make them, and we all know those people, the oldest things in the book were like, you have to buy this crystal or this candle and do this and do that in order to get this lifted. When people are going through stuff, I have been a victim of this 100%. People do whatever. And I think there are not so great people who see that, oh, this person gives readings and all these people give them money. If I do it, I can make money. And those people don't really care about their clients. They're just doing it to make money and they're just doing it to exploit them. Not because they want to actually help them heal and they're charging for their services because they're putting out their energy. They just want to make money and they don't really care what happens to the client. So I feel like that's something people see a lot. The people who are exploiters are now doing the exploiting based on that. I have been personally affected by that before. I have met, um, again, a grifter, like we talked about earlier. And I've been in a bad place and been exploited by people because I wasn't in a good place. Thank God it wasn't for thousands of dollars or anything, but it's happened to me. And honestly, I got this call. I'll never forget this call. This happened to me maybe two years ago. I got a call from a, it was a young woman and she was hysterical calling me about how oldest trick in the book, right? She met this woman at her church, actually, okay? And the woman told her she would do a reading for her. She did a reading for her. This girl's boyfriend had left. He moved out. And the woman said she was going to help her. She's going to help her get him back. Took $6,000 from this girl. And the girl just didn't know what to do. And she's asking me, what should I do? And I was like... I don't like I didn't even know what to do I I told her to call the police like I didn't know what to do for this poor girl I wasn't gonna do a reading and take money from and she was still asking about her boyfriend at that point I did a reading for her like a quick one but mostly I told her you that lady stole your money and educating people on like those things to look out for is how we can help those people so the next question is should there be paywalled communities and online courses yeah Absolutely. If the people who are 
teaching you something, have gone through years of training, I believe they deserve to be paid for that. And they can pick whatever prices they want and you can pick if you want to be part of that community. I do believe there should be pay. Well, I do believe people should get paid. Teachers get paid. Teachers get paid for their for their education because they went to school. Professors get paid because they went to years of school and did years of research to get to where they were. So I do believe there should be paywall communities. And again, people have done apprenticeships. People have gone and done all this spiritual work. Why shouldn't they get compensated for that? I think they should. And how does somebody ensure the authenticity of courses, workshops, or memberships um, as a financial investment? That's also a good question. Do your research. Do your research to the best of your ability. Try to find out, like I said, that person's lineage. Where did they learn from? Where are they from? How did they learn? Do they have a degree? Did they do an apprenticeship? Have they lived amongst the people? Maybe if they practice a specific lineage have they lived amongst those people did they learn from an elder can you see where they are from like you really have to do your research to the best of your ability find other people who have maybe taken courses with that person what was their experience that kind of thing I think it's really important to do all that okay then we get to the conclusions and what are some of the conversations I'd like to see more of in the community research. I think we need to talk a lot more about research and origins. That's part of the reason I started this podcast is because we practice a lot of stuff in the community. Uh, Nobody knows where it's from. Everybody is folk. Okay. A lot of people are doing folk magic now or calling it folk magic and they're 100% right. It's folk magic. I saw somebody on say this on threads the other day and I think I reposted it and I cannot remember at the moment who said it. But somebody said (laughs) there's a lot of people calling themselves folk magicians and folk witches and they don't even know their folk. And I said, say it louder for the people in the back. That's one big problem that I see a lot is people be like this tradition. I'm a folk magician and folk from where? What folk? Which folk? I never heard of your folk. Like I, I need people to do a little bit more research, just a little bit. Just to do 20 minutes of Googling ain't going to kill you this you can do it you need to know where your information is coming from don't just believe somebody because they have eight hundred thousand followers on instagram that's that doesn't make them a, a reputable source not at all not at all it makes them a good marketer nothing wrong with being a good marketer but i'm just saying what are my community needs i want to be honest i love entertaining content that's why we love the internet right also That's why we love the internet at times, but I just need people to be a little bit more real about stuff sometimes. Tell tell us how it really is once in a while. I guess that's that. How can we help each other remove external peer pressure and grow? I think that we all need to remind each other that just because my practice looks like this, your practice never has to look like this. And you can have a wonderful, fulfilling spiritual practice that, that helps you grow in every way doesn't have to be perfect doesn't have to be instagrammable doesn't have to be tiktokable and you can have a beautiful practice that makes you happy and fulfills your every need that you need from a spiritual practice how can we as a community come together with more constructive criticisms without it seeming shady or passive aggressive? I think that we could do it, but I think everybody has to, oh, I hate to sound like this, but I think everybody has to relax a little bit. Everybody's not coming for your neck when they say you've culturally appropriated something. Everyone is not coming for your neck. We're just trying to make you aware. And people have to say things with kindness and diplomatically and not just be like, eh, don't be catty don't be nasty you can just tell somebody they're wrong without being mean oh I I wouldn't I don't think that's that seems like a tradition that's closed that might not be something you want to speak on that that's a closed practice that's a closed tradition that's not something you want to speak on I've said it to people before I'd say I've said it to people before I've said 
hey, I know what you posted. That's cool. But And it was somebody, don't get me wrong, that I was cool with at the time. But I said, man, I, if I were you, I wouldn't be posting about that. That's not your, that's not your ministry. Those aren't your people. And I don't think the people who do belong to that group are going to appreciate you talking about that. Like, but, like I, I don't think that's a good idea. But I think we have to approach each other with kindness and also under, like understanding. Because sometimes people say or do things that there's no in, like harm meant, right? But even if they do harm, we can tell them like, hey, you've done something that's not cool. I don't, and like, honestly, four out of five times, people will be like, oh shit, I didn't realize, I didn't know, let me go back and retract that statement. Like, like people, most people are good. Most people don't want to, especially in this community, most people don't want to cause harm. Most people don't want to be assholes. They, they really don't. They want to have a good time and they want to talk about spirits. They don't want to be cruel. So I think we have to approach each other with kindness. Now, if somebody starts being nasty to you, I'm not saying keep approaching them with kindness. But I'm saying at first, let's approach each other with a little bit of kindness when we remind each other, hey, maybe you shouldn't say that or maybe you shouldn't do that or maybe that's not your ministry. Don't talk about that. But just do it with kindness. How can we as a community do better when we receive criticisms and feedback? Listen to what people are saying. What did I do wrong here? Did I do I feel like I did something wrong here? Find a friend. Accountability buddies. I'm saying this is okay. If you're truly confused, and again, I know we always say it's true. It's not other people's job to educate you. I understand that. And do your best to educate yourself. But if you are truly confused, if you've done research, if you've read and you're like, I can't figure out why I said something wrong, phone a friend, phone a friend, phone somebody and ask them, hey, what do you think of this? Phone a friend, somebody who you trust, who will tell you the truth. Okay, do your research first, but phone a friend. Who are some of the community members that I look up to that are reliable resources and aspirations? To be honest, I can't even go through the list. I can't even go through the list. Honestly, if you go on, if you look at people on Dying with the Divine Instagram, people I follow, I trust all them bitches. All them bitches I trust. Sorry if you don't like to be called a bitch. I'm not trying to be rude. I trust all them. I'm telling you something right now. I trust them people. If I see somebody say something sus, I'm like, uh-uh, I unfollow them, okay? I have had so many practitioners on my show, I trust them. I have practitioners who are coming on my show, I trust them. That's the only reason. If I don't trust them, I don't even post their episode, okay? There's, there's, and I'm not gonna lie, there's actually been a few, like, not a few. There's been a person or two who, like, I didn't trust what they said. And I didn't air their episode. Never aired their episode. Because I was like, this is sus. This is sus. I don't think this person really knows what they're talking about. Oh. I would be like, I really don't think this person knows what they're talking about. Okay. Nope. 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 <laughs> I can't. I can't do it. I'm not saying you have to look at me as a reliable source. But just know that me out here, I'm only following people who I really trust their information. Because if you don't tell me and you can't explain to me how you know this. You can't tell me your history. If you can't tell me anything about your lineage, I don't trust you. I don't trust you at all. <sighs> anything else I have to say about this? Social media is awesome. It's an awesome tool, but there's a lot of people who are just talking out of their butt. So just be careful. Do your own research. Ask questions. Any And people shouldn't be, that's the last thing I'll say. People shouldn't be offended when you ask them a question about where did you learn this? Where did you get that? People shouldn't be offended by that. Like, it's okay to just say, oh, I, I read this here. Or I read this out of this book. And then to be able to tell you the source. People shouldn't be offended. They just shouldn't. Because that, to me, is definitely the sign of a grifter. Anyway, those are some of my opinions. I know this is a little bit of a rant. But I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you guys get to listen. I hope I made some sense because me sometimes I'd be ranting and I apologize. Okay, talk to you later. Bye.